Okay, this is going to close out uh, part six. The next, the, the final segment of part six is a summary about how to, you know, go forward. Uh, part seven is going to cover the ground again, but from different angles, you know, mass, you know, with regard to the masses. But that's kind of what starts this close about the kingship thing is the difference between God deeds and good deeds from the standpoint of the difference between kingship and the masses. And it's kind of, in, a, in its own way, the most important thing to understand. The essential difference between God deeds and good deeds is bifurcated. The first, it's a God deed. God is first. God's doing the doing. And you're agreeing to what he does to you is because of him. It's vertical, not horizontal. Good deeds are all horizontal. People to people. First commandment is vertical, not horizontal. If the vertical isn't in place, the horizontal is no good. This is the test that Satan failed. He was rocking along for a while, but then the vertical relationship between God and him got to him. And he stopped refusing the pas de deux that God wanted to do. God enjoys pouring himself into you. That's the God deed. And the relationship is to say yes to that. But the problem in the relationship, as you've now seen, is that you're, it's con you're constantly aware of the, this incompletion and the inadequacy that you are. Now, God isn't doing this to you to make you feel bad about yourself. He's doing it to you to make you feel good about the solution. He is solving the problem. So here you go. It's a vertical relationship with this totally superior person you come to love. And he's solving the problem that you progressively understand by doing what he's doing to you. Oh God, I'm not good enough for you. Yeah, and I'm doing something about that. So it really boils down to do you focus on the problem or do you focus on the solution? My pastor's looking at me from heaven right now. I bet he's laughing his head off because he stressed this so many times. Every relationship has problems and solutions. If you keep focusing on the problem and not the solution, then the relationship will be painful to you. It's always there's a problem and always there's a solution. The two are together. It's a joining. God has this thing about joining high to low at every single moment in time in every single direction. He loves doing that. That's why it's okay to be low. Because even if you were perfect, you're still low compared to Him. So this whole argument about superior and inferior is used by God as an excuse to pour himself into you and you get togetherness flat, total intimacy. And again, the analogy is to sex. Husband and wife. Husband is superior to the wife. I don't think I have to explain the, the genitalia to you, how that works. I mean, you know, I'm, I've sort of forgotten how it works because it's, I'm, let's see, I'm 59 now. I think the last time I did that sort of thing, I was 27. But I still remember the anatomy. God is therefore always depicted as a male. You got that. That's why he invented sex. Yeah, the male is superior to the female, but there's this thing called sex that the two of them are supposed to enjoy solely with each other, in which they are equal, giving and getting pleasure to each other. As my pastor liked to put it, it's a vacation. 
Sex is designed as a vacation for the couple who are married to each other. That's why it doesn't work outside of the marriage. That's why it doesn't work male to male or female to female. The parts don't fit. It's a fitting. God is fitting himself into you. You get that? That's why Paul was so obsessed with the pregnancy thing. The only virgin apostle just talked incessantly about begetting. Well, you know what begetting is. That's a fancy name for the F word. Of course, the F word is kind of used for, I don't know, a, a, a putting down, using the act to put down the opposite person. But that's not how God's thinking about it. And it's certainly not the way the husband and wife think about it. It's their intimacy. It's their total, united, joined intimacy. And that's why God invented sex. So he could give you, he could let you understand what it's like for him. What he thinks about it. So that's what this is. Well, Satan, Satan just found it upsetting. Eventually. And so do we. Because the superior, inferior thing just, you know, the old sin nature just can't handle it. And Satan, of course, was the first guy to get his sin nature. And this is why he got it. So the whole sin nature thing is a big inferiority complex. That no matter what you do, it's not going to be assuaged. So the sin nature has to hallucinate being superior, which is what he did. That was the original sin. And it's constantly trying to assuage its, you know, awareness of being inferior just the same. So it hallucinates or it feels guilty. That's basically the human race. So the king is superior to the peasant. The purpose of being a king is to think for the peasant. Because the peasant wants to do stuff with his body not with a soul. So the king is providing the head. And the peasant loves to look up to the king and loves to imitate the king and loves to call himself a servant of the king. Just like we like to be servants of God. And the big problem is how can I, when you realize how big God is, it's well, but I can't serve you. And God's saying, yes, I'm saying, I mean, he's the authority, right? If I pour myself into you, that really pleases me. That's what I want. You want to serve me? Let me pour myself into you. And then I'll show you how great that is. So you don't have to feel bad about it. I didn't make you in order to do pet tricks. I'll do all the tricks. Watch. Now, the part of the other problem of this kind of the thing that goes with this is that since God is bigger and he is pouring himself into you and this also has an analogy to sex it hurts because he's so big I don't think I have to explain the physical analogy to that do I it hurts because he's bigger it's going to naturally hurt because he's bigger. When you go to exercise, the, the idea of exercise is, for the guys anyway, to make your muscles bigger. Really, the strength and size, but it's more strength is more important than size. But the strength comes from the size. Muscles need to be bigger and they need to be more, what do you want to call it, um, trained to work together. But there's a certain strength that comes from size. So you do all kinds of exercise, and it doesn't feel good. If it's working, it usually doesn't feel good. So it's going to hurt. And that brings me to the main point of this audio. It's the knowledge. The relationship with God is a knowledge. It's all in your head. These people, idiots, 
faith heart you you have a head belief but not a heart belief so you're not really saved your heart's a pump it doesn't know anything belief is something you can only do with your soul and the soul depends on knowledge and what hurt so much about the cross was this huge bam of knowledge hitting him in only three hours bam 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 and he's got to answer that knowledge immediately. Knowledge is crushing. It's knowledge, not body. This is the number one difference between king and peasant. Peasant's all about body. Peasant's a child. Peasant's a baby. King is a head. Knowledge controls the body. Knowledge is crushing. I hope this never happens to you. But if you were to go home and you get to the place where your house is supposed to be and instead it's just this flattened ground, it's going to be devastating. At first, you're not going to believe it. You're just going to be standing there in front of the vacant lot going, am I really at the right address? And as it slowly dawns on you that your house is flattened, and of course, at first, you don't know why. You're just going to be in a state of shock. You can't move. You can't think. You can't talk. Because the knowledge has crushed you. When somebody does something that you really don't expect, either too good or too bad, way over the top, you just, you have to sit down in a state of shock. Somebody you really care about dies. You get bad news about a disease or a disaster. How do we all re react to 9-11? We're looking at the television over and over and over again and we can't adjust to what we see because the knowledge is crushing all over the world everybody reacted the same way knowledge of God crushes most of all it is an entirely different kind of suffering from what the baby Christians tell. Oh, I'm suffering for Jesus. No, you're not. You have no idea what suffering is. The knowledge that 99% of the people out there that you're going to interact with or not, but you know that they're there, the knowledge, just knowing, they're going to hell. How do you how do you even take the next step? How do, how can you want to eat? How can you enjoy anything in life when you know that's what's going to happen to them? And the only reason it's going to happen to them is that they think God, the idea of God is bad. They just want to believe that God is bad. The atheist wants to believe that God is some kind of ogre. It, it pleases the atheist to believe that. Therefore, God does not exist. It pleases the non-Christian to think that the Christian God is this really bad person. For whatever his excuse. And so he never believes. I mean, th is there a greater tragedy than this? How do you get up in the morning when you know that this is a fact? The only way you can get up is to either A, just, God, please give me the verses or something so I can live on this, because if this is hurting me so much, how much more is it hurting you? Or the other alternative is to just deaden to it. Just try to put it out of your mind. And basically you end up doing a combination of both. You can't do anything about it. 
God did everything there was to do about it. And guess what? It's still going to happen. The only way God cannot do, do more is to like force it on people, which he won't do. Knowledge is crushing. Becoming a king in your head, having God pour himself into you, is a crushing experience from the knowledge alone. This knowledge makes you realize how much bigger everything is, how much bigger God is, how much higher things are, how much lower, therefore, everything else is, including you. How pointless this is. The tension is coming from the knowledge of the truth. And the natural question is, why did God ordain it then? And that was really basically, you know, kind of how Satan got to his position. Is that if this is the truth that God ordained, it shouldn't be the truth. It shouldn't be. It hurts too much. Truth be free should be wrong. Because it hurts too much. It's not fair to God. And it's not fair to creation. Therefore something must be wrong with God. And truth must be something else. Everybody who's ever believed in Christ and stops. Goes through that same analysis path. As I just explained. Satan went through. Sooner or later, you come face to face with God's design philosophy, whether you recognize that's what it is or not. Truth be free. Versus, truth be shaved, or unfree, or micromanaged, or something. To reduce the amount of suffering. You see how that can easily be parlayed into a moral argument, into a messianic stance? That's how Satan thinks. Satan thinks God is fundamentally wrong by decreeing truth be free. Therefore, if Satan thinks that what God decreed can't be the truth. It has to be wrong because of the suffering that goes with it. First for God and then for creatures. And as a king, you got those two basic philosophies. See, the king is the ruler. The king decides what is and what is not. God as king decided truth be free. He's training you to, to become a king. So you have to go through the same analysis process. And this is my big sticking point, just like it is with Satan's. I got the same sticking point he does. Everybody does. God went through it first, as it were. I mean, you know, he's always known it. He's always made this decision. He's always preferred it. Truth be free. Is it truth be free or truth be shaved? Is it truth be free with all the suffering that has to go with that? Because it's free to suffer. Or is it truth be shaved in the name of reducing suffering? And God's argument back to Satan is, once you start shaving, where do you stop? That's the big problem that in America, not, not just America, but other countries too, that the politics always have. You always got one party, usually called conservative, which is laissez-faire. Don't have any regulation. Government little. That's their position. Because the smaller the government, the more free the economy, the more free the people. And that, you know, that's a good argument. But you've always got the other side that comes in and in various flavors they call themselves usually liberals and they say no the government should control economy and society to some extent whether economic legislation business legislation social legislation because that reduces the suffering of the populace principally of course the poor and therefore some kind of reduction in freedom 
ought to be encased in laws which allegedly the government can better manage than letting you know the polity be free the argument is that government has to actually step in and have a parental oversight versus just you know let it all hang out and that's been the argument those are the basic two sides about politics that have been going on from time immemorial well that's the basic argument between God and Satan God's saying free period and it, and God takes upon himself you know the the whole juridical how to make justice out of everything because after all the first injustice just as Satan's claiming is against God if he says truth be free then the injustice is really against God he's the one that's got to see all the suffering he's the one that's got to do all the work it's unjust to him Satan hangs his hat on that argument that's why he thinks that God is somehow incompetent or made a mistake he still loves him but he thinks he made a mistake he, he thinks that, that God kind of you know just made a mistake about what truth ought to be and therefore what God decreed isn't really what truth is Satan thinks he's more moral than God that's why he said I will make myself like the most high God saying truth be free because you know what else is there and if he's gonna make good on all the injustice well he likes incurring that cost. That's an, it's essential to understand. He likes incurring the cost. So he likes pouring himself into you. It's okay if you're inferior. It's okay if you're wrong. He makes good on everything. He likes doing that filling. All in all, Ephesians 1, 23, and Isaiah 54, 1, making the sterile bear kids. Satan thinks that that is fundamentally wrong for God to have that rulership attitude and, and policy that, it's, that God himself is being unfair to himself and he's also being unfair to creatures. So Satan has an alternate rulership platform which is evidenced by good deeds. It ought to be based on merit. There ought to be a certain amount of tyranny in the name of reducing suffering. You know, it's really... On the surface, it sounds like a really good argument. See God? And this is what the, what the first temptation really is. That's the heart of the first temptation. That's why he mentions it first. You're not being fair to yourself to not eat. Turn the stones into bread. You're not being fair to yourself. You're not being fair to your creatures. Feed them. Feed yourself and them. That whole policy I just explained for the last 20 minutes is encapsulated in that very pithy verse. Speak the stones into bread is literally what he says. Not turn the stones into bread. Speak the stones into bread. That's Satan's whole platform. So as this developing king, the first issue is this whole problem of God being superior. And you realize he's throwing himself down. And like Satan, you begin to think, well, you know, this is kind of masochistic. It's not fair to God. And it's also not fair to you because the knowledge is crushing. Totally crushing. It's so over the top. In every direction and in every level. Your body can't even begin to hurt like this. Your body can't even function. Your, the knowledge flattens you. I can't tell you how many days I have so much trouble getting up just because of what I know. I wish I, I wish I could hide the truth from myself. Okay, but I can't. That's cutting myself off from God. I can't live like that. So it's like Paul says in Philippians 3.14, Kata skopon dioko. You get up anyway and it's plod, plod, slog, slog. This is why it's a slog. Because of what you know. And at moments, just like Satan, you're going to be tempted to say, This isn't fair. It's just not a fair design. 
It's not fair to God. It's not fair to me. There's no satisfaction. It's all one way. This shouldn't be what truth is. And then Satan came to convince himself that it isn't the truth. That's where he's getting his motive to keep saying no to God. This is what drives him. I mean, I don't know how many billions of years. I mean, supposedly the earth is 4 billion years old. Okay, so for the better part of 4.5 billion years, Satan has been fighting God. Why? How could he how could he do that? Why isn't he given up by now? This is why. So you're going to be coming front and center with this thing too in your development as a kingship thing. The knowledge crushes. Do you go with God's design philosophy, which is truth be free, which has oodles of ramifications in everything you do every day? Or do you go with Satan's side, which is to, you know, try to invent shortcuts, try to shave. Try to shave freedom a little bit so you can shave suffering. That doesn't mean you go out and seek suffering. It means you got to be smart about it. The suffering is in your head. So obviously you don't seek to like lacerate yourselves like they did in you know medieval times where they whipped themselves with whips on their backs. That's how clueless they were. Calvinists and Catholics alike were was flashing themselves on the back. Not all of them, some of them. I mean the hermits and all these people who, you know, that big craze in the Philippines where people were trying to get themselves crucified so they could identify with Christ. They have no clue what suffering is. It's in the head. And once you've gotten a certain kind of knowledge in your head, a bad knowledge that, that to you personally is devastating, your body can't function. You're in a state of shock. So you're living under a state of shock in spiritual maturity. Do you make the same decision? Okay, truth be free. And you can't. That's why I keep. I said in earlier segments, okay, God, you can do it to me, Isaiah 54, 1. I know you're doing it to me. Because I can't take this knowledge. I can't take it. I, I wish I were dead. The only reason I don't kill myself is because he's he's doing something to me that makes it worth his time. Otherwise, I, I see no reason to be here. Now, your particular reaction might be different from mine once you get to the same space. Because we're all different personalities. You know, different things affect us. But the very fact that this is the way things are, the truth is what it is, is devastating to know. How Christ survived it, I, I, I'm... I don't know. I mean, I can say the answer, but I still don't know. That's what I'm learning now. How to, how to survive every day. It, it wouldn't matter how, it doesn't matter how nice my life is. The knowledge just, just flattens. Okay, now Satan's side, which is why he came to that side, because he couldn't take the pressure. I say it can't be true. Truth ought to be something that you manipulate for the sake of the suffering to reduce it God says no God does the opposite he joins high to low at every point and you know what he fundamentally says about suffering suffering births that's why he designed it the way he did the woman will have pain in childbearing that was ostensibly the punishment to the woman for sinning. But actually, it's the deeper truth. Suffering births. And the idea there is you don't mind suffering if it births something you want. And then Christ would update that whole idea in the Gospels, saying that, you know, the woman, when she finally, you go to all this trouble and labor, because he was trying to explain the cross, I'm going to all this labor, and I don't care. I'm happy to go through it because of what it births. And, of course, that's Isaiah 53.10.
If you will give your soul as a substitute for sin, you will see long-lived seed. I'm sort of skipping down to Isaiah 53.11. He sees while he's on the cross and he is satisfied. You will see Yarikyamim, long live seed. That's Isaiah 53.10. He's on the cross, Isaiah 53.11. Yere, he will see. Yizba, he will be satisfied. Again, God is likening it to the sex act. You go to all that effort. And then at the end, there's the payoff. God made it that way. So he's not shaving suffering. He's completing its purpose. He designed a purpose for suffering. So that's why you got to get smart about it because you can suffer for nothing or you can suffer smartly. So that's part of kingship training too. Is that the suffering that you go through in the spiritual life is far bigger than any of those baby Christians can even imagine. Me'amal nafsho, the suffering of his soul, Isaiah 53.11. Betato yatzdik, manufacturing out of righteousness, manufacturing righteousness out of knowledge. That's a parallelism. Me'amal nafsho, out of the suffering of his soul. Betato yatzdik, out of the knowledge he makes righteous. See the, the parallel? So God is birthing an entire kingdom in your soul. That's why it hurts. That's why it's devastating. That's why you gotta do what Paul said. Katas kopon dioko. I stobrabeo. Tesa no klesios tu teu in Christo Jesu. As um, Philippians three fourteen. Onward I plod to the goal of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Over and over and plod and plod. That's it. That's what Satan never would do. That's love. That's Christ's love. That's kingship.